Good evening. Um, just introduce myself. Uh, uh, my name is Daniel Gray. I'm currently a senior developer and mentor at Gilmond in Bournemouth, uh, one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, I've been in software development now for a little over 20 years, uh, and I've worked in a number of different businesses, big, small, all sorts of different sectors. Um, I've made small things, I've made big things, I've made dumb things, and I've made some quite smart things. One of which is sat at the front over there, <laughs> quite unhappy with me. <laughs> um, and what I'm going to talk to you this evening about is uh, based on my, some of my experiences of our particularly wonderful industry um, and some revelations, I've, well, not revelations, but understandings that I came to whilst reading a rather excellent book called How to Fly a Horse. It's written by a gentleman called uh, Kevin Ashton. Uh, Kevin's a, a futurologist, which is a sort of a word I'm not particularly fond of, um, but he's actually a really good one um, because of two amazing credentials that he has. One, he invented RFID tags, and the second is he coined the term IoT, Internet of Things, and he did it without realizing he was doing it. Um, now this book explores the idea of what creativity is. Um, and how we describe it in other people. The particular title, How to Fly a Horse, refers to the Wright brothers and their attempts to create the first aeroplane. We typically tend to think of them as having sort of just, well, they just invented the aeroplane. It was a one-off event. It took them forever. They went through hundreds of prototypes before they actually got to the point of building an aeroplane. They had to invent the wind tunnel be able to understand aerodynamics. It wasn't just something that happened, it was something that was hard. Now, in the book, he doesn't actually use this phrase that I've sort of tacked on the end of myth of genius. He calls it the myth of creativity. Um, so I'm slightly de deviating from what his sort of focus was in the book, but it's a, a theme in the book um, and something that we've all kind of been victims of. Um, We've all learned and heard about in our lives and been taught about these towering geniuses. People who are just plain, well, they're better than you. You know, you, you're you never gonna be able to compare yourself to them. They're always gonna do things that you can't do. Um, but, and here's the great lie about it all, is you are just as capable, really. Um, you're, you're a human. Creation, invention, innovation, whatever you're going to call it, is something that humans do, and all humans do, even if necessar you don't necessarily realise you are doing it. So, I'd like to ask you all a question, and some of you already know the answer to this, and if you do, shut up. Uh, <laughs> there's a word we use in modern language that's synonymous with boring, uninteresting, and commonplace. Anyone got an idea about that, what that word might be? If in a moment no one gets it, I can give you a visual clue, which at which point you will go, oh, I know what that word is. Basketball. No, basketball's not boring. <laughs> anyone? Vanilla. Vanilla. So we talk of boring old software frameworks like uh, vanilla active server pages, uh, a vanilla song, is bland and uninspiring. This is brilliant, I, mean, I looked this up. When Prince Charles married Camilla, a newspaper branded her plain vanilla Camilla. But it wasn't always the case with vanilla. It's 1841. Vanilla is one of the rarest substances on earth. Global annual production of vanilla is one or two tons because it only grows in one tiny part of Mexico, just off the Gulf Coast. Europeans had taken the vanilla vine to various other places, Europe, across the Caribbean, and attempted to grow it in other places. And whilst the vine would grow, it would never pollinate. And without pollination, you don't get vanilla pods. Without vanilla pods, you don't get vanilla. So it was stuck to growing in one little place. And the reason it wouldn't, and this guy's great, uh, one of the reasons it wouldn't pollinate is it didn't have a pollinator. 
It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that the actual pollinator was identified, which is this guy, a beautifully named green orchid bee. I didn't know bees came in green until I was composing these slides. Um, without that pollinator and that one pollinator, you will not, not get pods. And without pods, you've got no boring old vanilla. Now, as I said, vanilla vines have been taken all over the world. But our particular story here focuses on one small island, just two and a half thousand square kilometers in size, Reunion Island, a uh, modern name, which is in the Indian, Indian Ocean, 175 kilometers southwest of Mauritius. Now, onto this island in 1829 was born Edmund. Simply Edmund, didn't have a surname. He wasn't allowed a surname. No, he was genuinely, they didn't have surnames because he was a slave. His mother died during childbirth. He never knew his father. He was never given a surname and yeah, born into slavery. When only a few years old, he was gifted to a plantation owner, Farrell Bellia Beaumont. Edmund grew up on the plantation and had the very good fortune to be taken under his master's wing. And his master would walk around the plantation. His master was a keen horticulturalist and he'd be walked around the estate and his master would talk to him about fruits, vegetables and flowers and this vanilla vine that they had, which they'd grown successfully since 1822, but had never grown a single pod. Now, Edmund's master, as well as describing sort of what the plants were, had also described the growing scientific understanding of the sex lives of plants and flowers, including how you could manually fertilize a watermelon, <laughs> of all things. This is a conversation you have with your slaves. Um, <laughs> And the, uh, the manual fertilization of watermelons, basically you would you take the, the two sex organs and you would bring them together to self-pollinate. Now, Edmund, listening to this, reasoned, can we do the same thing uh, with the vanilla vines? Now, he didn't know about the lack of a pollinator. He just knew that they never pollinated. And one morning, late 1842, Ferrioles taking his customary walk around the plantation with Edmund in tow and startled to find on the vanilla vine two tiny little green pods starting to grow. He was even more surprised when Edmund piped up that, yeah, that, that was me. I did that. Um, Ferriol didn't, didn't believe him. <laughs> it, was, it was fantastical. The, the, some of the greatest minds in European horticulture had attempted this feat and had failed. How's the slave doing it? Um, over time, more and more of these green pods started to emerge on the plantation's vanilla vines, and <laughs> Ferriol had to take some interest. So one day he takes Edmund to one side and says, so what exactly have you been doing to my vanilla vine? Because we've got quite a lot of pods now. Um, and Edmund showed him how he carefully pulled back the lip of the flower. He had a tiny little piece of bamboo. Using that piece of bamboo, removed the, the flower's own protection against self-pollination, um, and then gently pinched together the anther and the stigma to self-pollinate the flower. Voila, you have a pollinated flower. Now, this technique, once it was proven to actually work, uh, was taught to the other plantation owners uh, and their workers, and slowly but surely, this idea spread across the entire world. To this day, vanilla is still pollinated using the same te technique. That previous photograph was a modern photo, and that's Edmund's technique. Uh, and the French call it le geste d'Edmond, so literally Edmund's gesture. The consequences of this discovery are far-reaching. On the day of Edmund's discovery in 1842, the global production of vanilla was 2,000 beans on that one day. In 2010, on the same day of the year, global production was 5 million beans. 250,000% increase, and almost all of them produced with that same gesture. Now, for a long time, 
a lot of people tried to take credit for Edmund's discovery. Uh, fortunately for him, his master was very vigorous about giving proper credit to his slave, partly because it probably made him look quite good about it. Um, many would believed it was, a, it was literally impossible that an uneducated slave child could come up with something so profound. Um, but it wasn't actually all that surprising. It wasn't really anything amazing. Edmund needed only three things to achieve what he achieved, and they are knowledge, opportunity, and effort. Now, the knowledge came from the growing understanding of plant biology that his master had unwittingly almost passed on to him just in casual conversation. The opportunity came from the fact that, that he happened to be living in a place where there was a huge vanilla vine. And the effort came from the, his simple determination to actually do it. He didn't have anyone telling him to do it. He self-motivated himself. His master wasn't going, so, Edmund, come on. Managed to figure out how to pollinate the vanilla vine yet today. He just cracked on. He did it on his own. Now, we don't know how many attempts Edmund went through before he got this technique right. We, I think it's safe to assume it wasn't his first try. Um, <laughs> But he did manage it. But what's, what's really amazing about Edmund's discovery is that you know about it. Edmund was a slave. Well, should never have heard about it. But we do know his name. You'll notice here he's actually got a surname. Uh, uh, the point of, his, uh, of being given his freedom, which was actually quite a long time after he'd made this discovery. His master wasn't that generous. Um, uh, the point of being given his, his freedom, he was given a surname. Um, it's amazing that we know that he did these, the, these things. And we l now live in a culture of attribution. And it means that forevermore, Edmund will be known as the founder of the global vanilla industry. But, <laughs> and there's always a but, that culture of attribution has a dark side. We tend to believe that only certain people are capable of certain things. That if you're not predisposed to solve a certain problem, well, then you, there's no point trying. You're not going to solve it. If you're not born with certain attributes or into a certain environment, you, well, then you may as well just give up. You're, you're not the person to do it. Edmund teaches us that that's quite frankly nonsense. An orphaned slave created the vanilla industry at the age of 12. Except <laughs> he didn't do it on his own. He didn't discover the sex life of plants. He didn't identify what the sex organs of a flower are and how they work. This had been done by others before him. He merely came up with a novel and simple methods to reapply other people's knowledge, a twist, an increment on what had come before. Yet that little step produced a huge leap forward. We tend to ignore the fact that what appears to be great innovation is actually very often a tiny step on a path that we've already been walking for quite some time. Now you know this gentleman, hopefully. Anyone? Newton, Sir Isaac Newton. Now, you've probably heard of Sir Isaac Newton's famous quote, if I have seen further than other men, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. So the previous story I just told you, that came out of uh, Kevin Ashton's book. I didn't write that story. It's true, by the way. Uh, um, so in doing this talk, I have already stood on the shoulders of another giant. So I'm standing on Kevin's shoulders. Um, and when we think about Newton's quote, we do tend to think about him standing on maybe one or two people or maybe a small sort of group. Something that looks a bit like that. But what Newton was really referring to is something more like this. <laughs> I 
It's Newton at the top, by the way, if you haven't figured. Um, and that stack of people is going back throughout the whole of human existence. Newton wasn't standing on the shoulders of a few people. Newton was standing on the shoulders of all people. Going back to the first time a human reasoned, uh, a rock was a much more useful way of crushing a skull than using your fists. <laughs> no one... <clears throat> It's true, though. Without that discovery, without that understanding about an easier way to get meat, we wouldn't have had the time to not worry so much about food, to then sit and think about other things. Each discovery builds on top of the next one. Um, no one person can possibly be responsible for creating all the knowledge that's required in any given discovery or innovation. It's, it's impossible. N it hasn't happened since that guy with the rock. And even he was probably based on someone else who tried it with something not as hard as a rock <laughs> and went, oh, nice try, me try rock. <laughs> <laughs> so we all stand on the shoulders of the giants whenever we're doing anything. Just think how many generations of knowledge are required to build the first CPU and then think how many more generations of knowledge you've got to go before you get to the point of the internet. How many of you think of all those generations of knowledge when we're all slapping Zuckerberg on the back for the fact that he created Facebook? You don't, you, you only see the tip of the iceberg. You don't see what's buried beneath. You see what's immediately obvious and apparent. And so we kind of go, well, he's a genius. And you're like, no. There's all this under. So, I'd like to take some time to explore a personal brush with genius. And I'm putting it in quotes because it's, it is, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> My realisation that genius isn't all it's cracked up to be um, came about in uh, about 2007, 2008. So I was working for a company in Southampton called iMessa. I met her, we're building a uh, remote electronic voting platform for non-statutory elections. So that's things like unions, school councils, anything that isn't governed by the representation of the People's Act. So basically it's an election that can be conducted in any way. It doesn't have to be secure, it doesn't have to be proper. Um, based on their experiences of building this non-statutory platform, they'd managed to land themselves a place on um, a new Electron, election modernization program that the Department for Constitutional Affairs was running. And I was very lucky to be a member of the senior staff that was going to guide the design of this platform. Now, this program was intended to trial statutory voting platforms that had never previously been built in this country, never been applied into real elections um, in local elections. And when I say local, I mean local council. So you know, n not MPs, uh, primarily to test different ways of doing it. Would they work? Could they work? Would the public accept them? What would the public think about them? And would it have any effect on the way the public voted in terms of turnout? This was a big thing. The perception was you, you put people online to vote and everyone will vote. Personally, I think they're very wrong. People will vote if they want to vote. Now, one of the problems with it is voter expectation. Because we've never had remote electronic voting in statutory elections, people's experience of remote electronic voting is crap like X Factor. And that doesn't have, to, doesn't have laws. Well, it's got laws, but they're not anywhere near as vociferous as uh, those covering statutory elections. And their expectation is that it's going to be exactly the same. Because why would it? This thing already works. I already know how to do this. This is their accepted model. There's one sort of slight problem with that, and that's that you're not ever realistically going to build a statutory voting platform that looks anything like voting on X Factor. Voters expect a system like this. I'll take you through some of the interactions. So. You have your user devices, a transport, which is going to be the internet, and a voting platform. They expect to be able to 
authenticate themselves to the voting platform. Username, password, pins, whatever. The voting platform, once it's authenticated, you determine that you have an enfranchisement, a right to vote, and what your authority is, then send you back a ballot. So your list of choices. And then you as the voter sit there on your device, you peruse your list, and you pick the guy you were going to vote for anyway. And then you submit that ballot back to the voting platform. That's the expectation. The problem is one of security. So I, as a system designer, I can secure the voting platform. It's going to be a pile of servers in a, a data center somewhere. I can layer all the physical and software security, all the cryptography I want onto those systems. I can secure the transport. We've got HTTPS, all sorts of cryptography we can apply there. We can roll our own cryptography. I cannot secure the user devices. The whole point is that people are going to be voting on any device that they have to hand. They, that's what they want to do. They don't want to have to use a specific machine to vote on. The user devices, and this is the great problem with it, are completely untrustworthy. Any code of any origin could be running on those devices and could interfere with the ballot. Uh, no amount of clever coding or cryptography that we can use to secure the rest of the chain can secure those user devices. You can't protect against the fact that you're going to present to the user a list of choices and they're going to put a check against it and then you're going to submit that choice back. Malicious code that's running on the user device is completely free to inspect what, those, what their choice was or change it. Um, both of those scenarios, so uh, ballot alteration and ballot uh, inspection or exposure, are fundamental threats to the security of a statutory election. Uh, legally, forget it. You, you can't run an election if those things exist. Um, and any voting platform that allows those things to happen is so flawed that it's actually threatening the basis of democracy. You can only imagine what a certain malicious state actors might wish to do with something like that. A platform like that can be exposed to these kind of attacks with a Chrome extension that moves your HTML around. That it goes, oh, well, there's a radio button. That's got, uh, that says Labour in it. I'm going to take the ID out of that. I'm going to swap it with the Conservative one. And instantly, as a voter, you don't, you don't know. Um, when it come, the response comes back and goes, ah, oh, congratulations, you voted for Labour. Oh, I was meant to be Conservative. Right, we'll just change the HTML again. And that's, that's, that's easy. It's so, so ridiculously simple, and there's nothing you can do to protect against it. So, the team at iMeta, working on this platform, were very aware of this fundamental flaw with the approach. There was no way to give voters exactly what they wanted without undermining the very thing we were trying to secure and trying to make better. Since the point of this DCA program was to evaluate different types of platforms and how they behaved, uh, we made a decision to not give voters what they expected. We were going to swing to the other side. We were going to swing to build the thing that works. If they don't like it, fine. That's the outcome. We were still going to get paid either way. <laughs> now, ideally, we'd, we'd build something that they, you know, that did the job and that they accepted and everyone was happy. But if the outcome was we did the right thing, but they didn't like it, well then, okay, we put it back in the box and we walk away from it. Fortunately, in our endeavors to create such a thing, uh, we were gonna get our moment to stand on the shoulders of giants. GCHQ were very heavily involved in uh, this program, as you can well imagine, it's in their their remit to protect <laughs> democracy at its fundamental level. And they gave us a protocol that someone else had already written, um, although it had never been implemented in a proper system. And it's a protocol called the pre-encrypted ballot. And I will take you through how this protocol works. 
So the pre-encrypted ballot avoids the problem of transmitting a ballot and the voter intention in an inspectable or alterable way by pre-encrypting it. And I put that in air quotes because it's not really encryption. It's just called that. Process works thus. You come along, you register the, you, your intention to vote electronically. So after they've received that registration and after all the candidate nominations have been made, <coughs> excuse me, uh, voters are issued via secure postal mail a pre-encrypted ballot. Something looks a bit like this. Obviously, those aren't real candidates. Ba <laughs> ballot is composed of list of candidates, affiliations, uh, a PSIN, which stands for a uh, personal candidate identification number. The these names were never going to be the real ones. They, they, these were the kind of developer identifiers just so that we knew what it meant. Someone had to come up with sexier ones. They never did. <laughs> <laughs> and a personal candidate response number, PCRN. Numbers had to be unique within the context of the ballot, but could be repeated across the voter body. So within your ballot, each of those four digit numbers is unique. You won't find a repeat in there. So come voting day, the voter has their credentials to authenticate, and they have their pre-encrypted ballot. Again, we have the arrangement we had last time. This time, however, after the user is authenticated, the voting platform does not send back a ballot. The UI, at this point, at its simplest form, can consist of a text box. A simple text box into which you type the piece in, personal candidate identification number, of the candidate you're going to vote for. Piece in sent over to the voting platform. The uh, voting platform can take that piece in, look up the stored pre-encrypted ballot, find out from that who the actual candidate really is, cast whatever appropriate ballot it needs to internally within itself, um, and it can then pick out the personal candidate response number that goes with that candidate for that voter. And then you send the PCRN back to the voter. The voter then is able to compare the PCRN they get back with the one on their ballot. Hopefully it matches. If not, if not, the instruction to the voter is something has gone horribly wrong. Someone has done something very bad. Go and alert the nearest authority you can find, regardless of who they are. Um, so at no point in that process has the voter's intention been exposed. The only thing that's gone over the wire, the only thing that's gone into the device is a PSIN. The only thing that's come out is a PCRN. No one's ever mentioned names of candidates, party affiliations. You look at that PSIN, you've no idea as an attacker what it means. So even if you get code running on the user device, all you see is a four digit number. Oh great, what does one, two, three, four mean? Sorry, you haven't got the bit of physical paper that was only ever sent out in the post, never went electronically. Without that, you cannot tell what that number means. It also gives us the ability to guarantee to the voter that that piece in was received by the voting platform because only the voting platform and the voter know what the PCIN is and what its corresponding PCRN is. So only the voting platform can tell them. Now, part of the uh, challenge of implementing this was securing, well, it was implementing what lives over in the voting platform in terms of how you store a piece in, in a way that if someone did manage to break into the voting platform, they can't readily identify what all the piece ins are, what all the PCRNs, because if someone gets in there, nicks them all, we're kind of back to square one. We managed to build a system that um, protected those values. I can't remember exactly how we did it, because it was damn near a decade ago. Um, and whilst I remember all of this, the exact details of the cryptography we came up with inside the voting platform, long, long, long since gone. So we told the DCA and GCHQ that we, were, we love the pre-encrypted ballot and we love it so much and we think it's such a goer, 
we are going to build our system on top of it. And from both of them, there was a great deal of rejoicing. Much rejoicing, in fact. Um, no other entrant on this program had even thought about using the pre-encrypted ballot. They were all going with, yeah, let's put a list up. We'll put a list up, put the, tick, put the tick in the box. We've got this clever thing we made up that means no one will ever be able to break it. <clears throat> on the back of their reaction, we knew we were doing something special. Uh, we were already differentiated. We'd taken the hard path and the right path. We knew there were going to be issues with usability. It's not necessarily the easiest thing to immediately understand, particularly if you're bogged down in a, well, I'm voting on X Factor, mate, sort of style mentality. But the security benefits weighed out, outweighed any disadvantages. GCHQ were incredibly happy, as you know, as you could imagine. They have, and not only were they happy, they were going to ultimately be one of the great deciders in terms of whatever platform would become something in the future. So we knew we have to keep GCHQ happy. Now, the rules that govern how a statutory election are run in the UK are codified in a wonderful document called the Representation of the People's Act. It's, so everyone working on this project at iMeta read the whole thing. It's five parts, 207 sections, 13 schedules, and 207 pages. It's not an easy read. The characterization is awful. Right? Some of the plot twists are awesome. <laughs> what it is full of is all the quirks of electoral law. Now, some of you might already be aware of this. I've probably told a couple of you. Everyone assumes that voting is secret because when you go to vote, you get your ballot paper and you go into your little booth, you draw the thing behind you, you scratch your, your, your X in the box and you take your ballot back out folded and no one ever sees it. So no one ever knows it's your vote, right? Yeah, kind of. Voting is secret. Your ballot isn't. There's a keychain that goes from a ballot back to the identity of the person that cast the ballot. Um, I try and remember what it's called. I think it's called the Australian ballot. Uh, and it was codified in the original Representation of the People's Act in, of 1918. The reason for this is uh, not to find out how you voted as a given individual, but for them to be able to take a pile of ballots at the, at the counting station for a given seditious group and go, who are the people that cast these ballots? Now, as far as I'm aware, it's been used twice in the history of the law, um, and only a uh, judge is able to authorise it, and it's, a, it's quite a big thing, as you can imagine. Um, and, but very few people know about it, and it was only through reading the Act that we found out about it. So we've been reading... We've been ploughing our way through the RPA, and during a design review meeting, we were discussing another part of the RPA, which we found difficult to get our heads around, which is proxy voting. Put simply, if you're not capable of casting a vote yourself, either disability or inability to access a polling station, and if you haven't got time to register for a postal vote, um, or you don't want to do a postal vote, you could apply for a proxy vote. The net result of a proxy vote is that you hand your enfranchisement for a vote to someone else and go, go on then, get on with it, and pray that they do what you tell them to. You've got absolutely no guarantees that your proxy is going to do what you say. There's nothing in law to actually say that they have to. Uh, and there's no mechanisms built into the process to ensure that they do. Given all the other protections that the, the Act sort of includes, it seemed either like the legislative had given up on this and just gone, oh, you know what, this is too hard, we can't solve this, or they just didn't care. It's such a minority of voters that eh, it won't affect the outcome of any given election. So we'd been sat there going, scratching our heads, expressing our disgust at this particular thing, 
we weren't trying to solve any big given problem. And we moved on to the next thing on our agenda, which was to talk about some particular details of our pre-encrypted ballot implementation. That's when I had my personal moment of genius. I say genius. And it was this, the pre-encrypted ballot can be extended to enforce the same kind of protections to people that require a proxy vote. And literally it was that thought. I didn't know how. <laughs> It took me, it, it took a couple of moments for me to actually figure out in my head what I meant by that. I'd had the idea without knowing necessarily what the implementation really was. Um, and I remember it happening really fast, so fast I can't pull out the actual mental steps that I went through at the time. Um, before that thought had managed to leave my brain, I interrupted everyone and went, hang on a minute, hang on, hang on, I've, I've got something, I've got something. <laughs> <laughs> Explained it to them. It took a couple of minutes and we tried taking apart the idea, which took another 10 minutes. No one could think of a way that it broke. And, and we all just sat there going, oh, we've got a new thing. And not only did it work, but it was new and it was innovative. No one had sort of thought of this before. I'll just take you through quickly the difference. The addition of an extra code on the end. It's called the, again, no one came up with a sexier name, the personal proxy candidate response number. So the new process would go something like this. Voter tells the proxy the piece in the candidate they want to vote for. The proxy doesn't know what that piece in means. It's just a four digit number. They also tell them this number, the number that they should expect to get back out of the voting platform. <coughs> proxy comes along, polling day, they cast the vote, but as well as returning the PPCRN, it returns the PCRN, which the voter had never told the proxy. So he's got this four digit number that they're never going to have heard of suddenly comes up on the screen and they get told, take that number and give it back to the person that you're proxying for. At which point they can go, ah, 5432. So you really did vote for Bob because there's no way for them to know what those numbers are going to be. We formalized this design. Uh, we wrote it up into protocol documents and we realized whilst Yes, this was a new thing. It didn't in and of itself constitute a new discovery. It was just an extension onto the existing pre-encrypted ballot. So as a group and a business, we made the decision that we weren't going to hold on to this idea um, and that we would share the design back with GCHQ um, on the basis that whilst yeah, we're trying to build a platform for ourselves, that platform is in the implementation, the protocols should be something that is owned by the people, security services, the government, because they're going to form the foundation of maybe not just our platform, but any other possible platform that comes along in the future. So we submit these design documents back to the DCA and GCHQ and went back to uh, actually carrying on the implementation of the things that we've been making up. That was the comment that we got back from GCHQ. Now you can imagine what that did to my ego. <laughs> GCHQ were very, very happy. It demonstrated two things to them. One, someone was taking this pre-encrypted ballot thing seriously to the point where they'd come up, someone had come up with an extension, was happy to have that extension back and plugged a hole that they were very aware of in the electoral pro process. GCHQ have a tendency to, they, they share some things, but they can be a little tight-lipped about where the problems are. So GCHQ had a concern about this particular thing, but never ever said anything about it. Um, so for the next few days after getting that feedback, I felt pretty much invincible. GCHQ called me a genius. <laughs> <laughs> a 
lots of back slaps, high fives from colleagues on and off the project. It, the sort of word spread around, but slowly by increments, it wore off. I realized without fully really realizing it, I wasn't a genius. I just made a small step. From the outside, it looks big because you've plugged this gap. Now, Kevin's book wasn't around at that time, um, so I didn't realize the parallels with, say, someone like Edmund, um, and I didn't fully realize it for a number of years afterwards, but I'd met the same three criteria as Edmund. Knowledge. The pre-encrypted ballot had already been written by someone else and supplied to us by GCHQ. I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, of all the people that have come before and standing on all the work that they've done. Opportunity was a chance to actually sit and think about these things and be paid for it as well, which was brilliant. Now, I've got a particular thing about democracy, um, so that opportunity was unique. Uh, the opportunity of that particular review meeting that we were in, the fact that we discussed proxy voting and our hatred of the existing system right before we started talking about the pre-encrypted ballot. If we'd had another subject in between, there's a very good chance I wouldn't have had that idea because I wouldn't have tied the two thoughts together. Complete coincidence. <coughs> and finally, effort. I spent nearly a year working on this project before we got to this point. As I said, I clawed my way through the representation of the People's Act, understanding obscure bits of English law on, uh, on voting. I'd spent a long time, not just at work, but in my own time, thinking about how we can make this thing better, where protocols didn't work, where they did work, what mattered to voters, what mattered to society, where the balance was, which side of it do we come down on. And whilst I haven't put it up there, but some of it was also luck, um, if you believe in such a thing. I don't tend to think of it as luck, I just think of it as coincidence. Um, everything else was graft. Um, the result of it all was something that's gone back to GCHQ, um, it's now stored away in their pile of approved protocols for any future electoral system or online electoral system rather. Um, and hopefully at some point we'll make it into a implementation of a UK voting platform because, or rather, but bad times were ahead for the program we were on. Uh, I met her were a late entrant onto this program. It was a multi-year DCA program. And in the first year, we weren't actually submitting a system, mainly because we didn't have one. Um, but because of their excitement, GCHQ had sat down with the DCA and had a little word in their shell like and persuaded them that uh, they should bend the rules around this particular program and that we should be allowed to not submit a system in the first year, but submit one in the second year. Unfortunately, Everyone else on the program, all the other companies, suppliers, weren't as thorough as we were. Um, so following what can only be described as a complete cluster flux on the first year, <laughs> combined with an unfortunate relationship between Swindon's head of election modernization and the marketing director of one of the suppliers, uh, the whole thing was canned. Year one happened there was never a year two. So what we were building never saw the light of day. Since then, remote electronic voting has been off the table completely. No one's touching it. No one has any particular interest. It's a, it's a weird thing politically in terms of who wants it, who doesn't want it. At the moment, there is no appetite for it at all. One day, <laughs> hopefully, what I wrote will become something useful, but it's there. So, finally, we're nearly done. You'll be delighted to know. I wanted to find some great quote about the Zen of genius ideas, written some, by some, you know, great philosophical writer. But I couldn't find anything that actually meshed with my experience and 
uh, understanding of genius. But then I remembered this, and it's a song lyric, because most things in my life are. And it's by a great band. If you've never heard of them, do listen to Pitch Shifter. Um, so, thank you for your time. I hope it's given you something to think about. Even if at least not, you know where vanilla came from. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free. <laughs> hey!